Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Objects That Change the World lecture series organized by the Miami University Humanities Center and the Miami University Alumni Association, today we proudly present Crazy Blues with Tammy Kernodal. Tammy Kernodal is professor of musicology and has published widely on African-American music, jazz, and gender in popular music. She is the author of the biography, Soul on Soul, The Life and Music of Mary Lou Williams, published by the University of Illinois Press. In 2018, Professor Kernodal was awarded the Miami University's Benjamin Harrison Medallion, which is the highest award given to a Miami University faculty member in recognition of their research, teaching, and service. She is currently president of the Society for American Music. Welcome to Dr. Kernodal, and thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. Questions were collected during the registration, and Dr. Kernodal will address some of those throughout the webinar today. You'll also have the option to ask a question during the webinar by clicking the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen. Please note that in the interest of time we have available, we may not get to every question. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including time for questions and answers. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kernodal. Welcome. Thank you, Molly. It's good to be with you again. Uh, and thank you to all um, who took time out their day to attend this lecture. So I want to start this conversation uh, with going back in time. I want to take you back to August 10th, 1920. It was on that day that a Harlem-based singer by the name of Mamie Smith entered the studios of OK Records. Uh, she had been working uh, in the Harlem scene for quite a while and collaborating with a songwriter by the name of Perry Bradford. Now, on that particular humid and hot day in August, uh, she set about recording a song written by Bradford uh, that would be uh, marketed under the title Crazy Blues. So let's hear this record. Thank you. 
So I surmise that Mamie Smith probably could have never known that that day, walking into that studio in that moment uh, and recording Percy Bradford, uh, Perry Bradford's song would ignite a cultural revolution that would alter not just the way in which the cultural industry of that time would view or engage with black music, but it would also ignite um, a cultural revolution that would take black music beyond the insularity of black communities that were being etched out both in the South and the North and create global sounds that would come to mark what was the emerging world and, and soundscape of post-World War I America and the rest of the world. And so in the time that's been given to me today, I want to talk about this recording, Crazy Blues, in 1920, a recording that is now identified by both scholars and listeners and, black, and blues enthusiasts as the first vocal blues record, and talk about its overwhelming influence and impact and legacy. And so I think the best way to talk about that is to talk about the singer and then talk about the sound, and then I will talk about um, what is the larger cultural implications of this recording. The uh, ascent of uh, the influence of Crazy Blues was largely rooted in its overwhelming popularity with um, first black audiences, but also white audiences. Crazy Blues in its first month after its release sold over 75,000 copies. Within its first month, it sold over 100,000 copies. And by the end of 1920, it had sold a million copies. No record before this time recorded by any Black artist, and let me be clear, there were only few Black artists that entered the spaces of studios in this emerging recording industry had ever sold this amount of recordings. In many ways, what Crazy Blues uh, did was it defied this mythology, this notion that had permeated the, the recording industry in terms of whether Black people would spend what little money they had to purchase not only records, but to also play, to also purchase record players. And so, uh, Crazy Blues comes at a point where it is at a nexus of emerging technology uh, in terms of leisure culture, the burgeoning of leisure culture in America, but also the identity politics that were framing America um, at the end of World War I, but also at the beginning of what would become this age of prosperity and modernity. So who was Mamie Smith? I think we have to start our conversation by talking about the voice behind the success, behind the movement, behind the revolution. She, like many of the black women who would come to define recorded blues culture in the 1920s, had largely developed her skill set in her formative years singing in the church and that that talent becoming a threshold for her to escape what was the monotony of Black life in America. Mamie Smith was actually born Mamie Robinson in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1891. There's very little that is known about her early life. But what we do know is this, by the age of 10, she was already performing with vaudeville groups here in the Cincinnati area. And not just Black vaudeville troops. I think Mamie Smith's life as a professional musician speaks to us about how there is this um, racial and cultural engagement that often takes place in border cities like Cincinnati, Ohio, which was a major port city that brought many people uh, here during the late 19th, early 20th century. And so we have Mamie Smith 
first, or Mamie Robinson, excuse me, first appearing with a white vaudeville troupe as a singer. And then later showing up as a dancer as part of one of the many black, all black um, vaudeville troops that traversed the United States in the early 1920s, uh, early 1900s. Around 1918, though, what we, we know is that she is kind of shifted away from the itinerant life of uh, these vaudeville troops and has begun to situate herself in the musical cultural life of Harlem. And she's singing in these Harlem nightclubs. And it's there that she encounters uh, Perry Bradford and also encounters her husband, who actually is a singer and a musician in his own right. And so uh, two years before uh, Mamie Smith enters this uh, New York-based studio, we have her honing a sound a sound that really was speaking to what was the, the, ep, the evolving sense of black culture in the urban North during the height of the great migration. But Mamie Smith's story I want you to know is not so unusual for this time. What we do know is this, that by uh, the time of her birth, 1891, the blues was already beginning to develop uh, as an important part of the soundscape of the South and Midwest. These iconic songs uh, that seemed very different from the spirituals and rags and stomps and other song forms and instrumental genres that were being cultivated by Blacks as they traversed throughout uh, the South and the Midwest uh, seem to, to have a, a subculture of their own, a belief system of their own. And most importantly, they documented an aspect of American life that no newspaper uh, sought uh, or thought was important. And so the, the blues became really a living newspaper an incubator for the identity politics as people shifted around this environment. We know that as early as 1906, a singer who originated out of Columbus, Georgia, was a part of the minstrel troupe practices of the 1890s and, and made that transition to vaudeville in the early 1900s, was beginning to integrate these poignant songs into her repertory. That person was Gertrude Pritchard, who is better known as Ma Rainey. And Ma Rainey's uh, promotion of the blues song and, and her popularizing of the blues song in the early 1900s was significant in shaping the culture and the soundscape of America. Ma Rainey traversed the United States in the circuit that was first introduced by minstrel show troops, but but were, were taken over and supplanted by vaudeville troops. In the summer months, they traveled and played in tent shows, but in the winter, they, they, they shifted their performances to theaters within larger uh, metropolitan cities. And so the blues became a part of this widening soundscape that people began to, um, to identify in the early 20th century. And women performers, more so than male performers, were beginning to really define this practice in this vaudeville um, circuit. Now, I don't want to give the impression that male performers were not important. But when we talk about the sound that we just heard with Crazy Blues, it marks for us the emergence and the ascent of the female blues performer. If you look at early blues scholarship, male performers are often privileged and they're all oftentimes situated as the originators of this culture. And that is due in large part to the fact that early country blues culture was really based in the itinerant lifestyle of sharecropping. And performers oftentimes um, occupied spaces that were gendered by their nature. 
They sang on street corners. They sang in juke joints. They sang in barrel houses. And these were male-centered spaces that, that framed how men occupied their spatial surroundings. Juke joints, barrel houses, um, chalk houses, all the different names that were used to identify these spaces where men went to drink and men went to gamble, that, that men in, in, engaged in prostitution sometimes. These were all male-centered spaces centered around leisure. Women only occupied those spaces if they were working or if they came as, in, in, as part of a domestic relationship. And so we closely identified country blues because these, were, these men were creators of these sounds that really showed the imprint of their travels. But as vaudeville began to blend with blues culture, in the early 1900s, women started to be strong articulators of this culture. And so Mamie Smith's arrival in Harlem is representative or emblematic of how vaudeville provided a platform and a doorway for women uh, to engage with the blues culture. So with that being said, then what about the sound of crazy blues? And, and the proximity of the sound of, of crazy blues in relation to this culture that I'm talking about. Now, I will be honest with you. I am using a lot of terminology today that is reflective of how blues scholarship in the 1960s sought to identify these different variant strands of Black sound. Uh, blues as a cultural idiom in its existence at this time had not been categorized in these different, um, utilizing these different terms. And so, and for instance, when we talk about Mamie Smith and crazy blues as a vocal blues, what we're talking about is a variant sound of the earliest form of blues. And so scholars designated this sound as the classic blues or as vaudeville blues. It's called classic blues because in many cases, uh, the scholars who use this identified this form as the first form of Negro entertainment music. And I'm using terminology that is rooted in the early 20th century. Vaudeville blues is what has evolved out of the scholarship of other scholars. Daphne um, Duvall Brooks, uh, for instance, uses this terminology because what she identifies in the sound is how the blues is being reconceived in the modern environment of urban cities in the north or border cities like Cincinnati and Memphis in the south, right? In these urban spaces, what we have is a blending of white popular song formats with country blues idioms and also the meshing of early jazz culture to create a specific idiom that not only spoke to the evolving consciousness of these black people and listeners and entertainers, but also to whites who inhabited sometimes these same geographic spaces based on their economics or who had an interest in this music because of the biracial cultural roots of Southern culture. So when we talk about crazy blues, crazy blues in 1920s is a representation of a type of modernity of American modernity in some ways, but more importantly, black modernity. And this black modernity is being rooted or crafted or defined in, in a series of things that are taking place in the years prior to this recording. One is the great migration, the mass exodus of Southern blacks to the North uh, that takes place at its height between 1915 and 1919. You literally have uh, thousands, uh, and some scholars estimate close to a million Southern Blacks who are beginning to move to urban cities, seeking not only new opportunities socially, but also uh, heeding the call of industry. 
uh, in its need to uh, to continue its level of production and proliferation do, as we are entering World War I and the influx of European immigrant uh, workers being in some ways shut off. The second thing that marks this modernity in this sound is uh, the racial tensions that began to emerge as this migration is taking place. These racial tensions hit uh, a, a, a high point in 1919 uh, when uh, we have we experience what is called the Red Summer. And the Red Summer is marked by a series of race riots that are taking place uh, throughout the country. Most people point um, specifically to the race riot that happens in Chicago during this period in time, which is precipitated by the killing of a young boy who um, innocently drifts into um, the white section of uh, a beach area there. Uh, and so finding the de line of demarcation in water and what signifies white space and black space creates one of these violent um, moments of insurrection where the black community is violently targeted. So there is trauma that is birthing this modernity in the black community. It is one that is centered also in the rise or the, the resurrection of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and this notion of America first being part of the political ideology uh, of the time. The third thing that this modernity is going to be rooted in is the, the cultural and social reaction that is taking place to all of these events within the Black community, particularly amongst the Black intelligentsia, which by 1919 is seeking to counter uh, what is this public narrative of the black threat uh, and these racial tensions, which are exasperated by the the movie Birth of a Nation, as well as um, the propaganda that arises out of um, the resurrection of the Ku Klux Klan. And so as a byproduct of this, there is a cultural movement that is beginning simultaneously that we identify as the Harlem Renaissance. But it is really a, a Negro Renaissance because while it is strongly incubated first in Harlem, we have um, congruent movements that are emerging in Chicago and Washington, D.C., in Philadelphia, and later L.A. and other spaces. And so this modernity is wrapped in all of these things, trauma and violence and movement and opportunity and access, resistance, but also new political ideologies that are seeking to redefine Blackness not only in a physical lived way and in what is projected as a lived experience, but what is also being sonically presented to the world as blackness. And so in order to understand what made um, Mamie Smith's sound seem so radical and, and what made it attract the type of attention that it did, I think we have to go back and we have to listen to what the blues was in a vocal form before um, we get Mamie Smith. And in order to do this, I want to go back to Ma Rainey. Now, let me be uh, let me be transparent. Although Ma Rainey is the first woman to perform the blues uh, on stages and to popularize the blues as part of this repertory that that vaudeville performers. Are, are extracting from. She does not record until much later in her career. Her recording career does not start until 1926. So Ma Rainey is important in terms of her framing of live blues performance aesthetic, right? And so by the time she's recording, Mamie Smith, Bessie Smith, you know, Alberta Hunter, they're all of these women who are, who have utilized the recording studio and the record to create uh, another context of blues culture. 
Ma Rainey is in many ways a bridge musically and ideologically in terms of the blues. She bridges what was that country blues sound that was incubated in the South and all the regional rare, uh, variants that took on from the Mississippi Delta blues, the Memphis blues, the Piedmont traditions, which she emanated out of, and all the variant approaches to the blues. And she bridges what is this new generation of blues artists that will be identified with this sound that we he hear in Crazy Blues that uh, will eventually be called vaudeville blues or classic blues. So to give you a sample and example of the variations or the differences and somewhat the similarities in their sound, I want to play Ma Rainey. <laughs> So here we have Ma Rainey, and this the name of this song is Hustling Blues. So this is Ma Rainey drawing on what was the lived experience of women that she encountered in her many travels. Hustling Blues is essentially talking about a woman who is um, economically supporting her family and her household through prostitution. Uh, so she's hustling. Uh, and in, in this blues, it is about the fact that she's not made any money and what tensions that creates in her household. But there's some key things that we hear in this example that are hallmarks of this style. First of all is the instrumentation. So we've got muted trumpet, we've got piano, but you'll also hear, if you listen to the complete recording, you will hear the jug as well. So Ma Rainey would move fluidly um, between different instrumental um, combinations based on uh, what she felt or what she visualized as part of that aesthetic. So this is her um, really reflecting what were uh, jug band traditions that were very prominent in Memphis in the Midwest. Um, but oftentimes she would perform with just solo piano or sometimes as you see visualized in this particular picture, she would um, she would perform with instrumentation that was emblematic of early jazz bands. So the you see the um, the trumpet and the trombone and the saxophone and the piano play. I'm going to come back and talk about the pianist in this example. But we also hear uh, the hallmarks of the vocal quality of the blues in which these blues women uh, really uh, sang in this belting style that was um that that was that was centered around filling a space and overcoming uh, what was the volume of the instruments around them so it's a very controlled belt it's very um it focuses on the warm aspects of the timbre right it's a very different sound that we equate with femininity especially if we are listening to white singers who are performing at this time. And so this is very transgressive in many ways in terms of the projection of what is a female sound in American popular music. Um, but but we also hear that Ma Rainey and sometimes in some respects uh, are, is dealing with content and dealing with language and dialect that would have been um, 
would have been understandable to the audiences, the Southern audiences that came to hear her, but not necessarily broader, more diverse audiences. And I mean, when I mean broad and diverse, I'm meaning not just white audiences, but Northern blacks, who many of which had no context in terms of, uh, you know, Southern vernacular language, as well as Southern culture. Now, I want to go back to offer another uh, sonic because I want you to hear somewhat the differences in this, um, because these things are a salient in terms of the legacy of Crazy Blues. Uh, a recording that um, Mamie Smith made six months prior to Crazy Blues, because most people focus on Crazy Blues as being um, this first significant record. But she actually made two records um, uh, in early 1920, um, that were really emblematic of Bradford's coaxing of uh, OK Records to record a Black singer. Um, and, and so this is very much rooted in this classic sound. And so I want you to, to hear a little bit of this. <laughs> So that's a thing called love that was, as I said, recorded just a few months before uh, Crazy Blues. And I wanted to play this record because uh, it remained dormant on the shelves of OK Records for several months before it was released in the summer of 1920. And upon its release, it immediately sold 10,000 copies without any um marketing or any fanfare whatsoever. Um, and so on one hand, what it indicated to OK was the viability, the economic viability of Black life. But what it also represents for us is just how misleading the, the use of certain terminology during this period in time can be in reference to what is actually happening musically. And so this is called the Vaudeville Blues and will be marketed as blues. But really, this is more of a conventional pop song that that brings in some elements of jazz culture. Um, and in some ways, uh, some of the ethos of the blues in that, you know, there is a narrative story that is being told without. But the some of the classic elements of the blues that 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 make the blues and a unique and identify blues song uh, uh, idiom aren't there. 
We don't have that same 12 bar blues skeleton formula, harmonic formula being emphasized. We also don't hear what is oftentimes viewed as blues poetry in the way that we heard in Ma Rainey. So what I'm what I'm trying to get to saying is that that, you know, this terminology really and the use of the term the blues was in many ways representative of how um uh, record companies began to realize with the growing popularity of, of Mamie Smith and these records, just how uh, viable black music would be, uh, and particularly in the, in the decade of the 1920s. So let me get to the heart of all of this because crazy blues, a thing called love and its success, growing success, inspired a marketing strategy that was enacted first by OK Records, but begins to proliferate to other record companies during the 1920s. And that that strategy would be called race records or race music. And so um, it, it represented the commodification of this culture, but it also represented uh, the industry creating real um, categories that were racialized. And so this context of racialized sound begins to be um, promoted and defined in the 1920s. So much so that uh, the records of artists like Mamie Smith, uh, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, those singers, and then that spreading to jazz, the jazz recordings of Joe King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band or uh, Louis Armstrong later on are identified by the label reading race. Uh, and white performers who are going to also in many ways be racialized and categorized after uh, a series of recording sessions in Bristol, Tennessee in 1927, you know, will we'll, we'll bear this marker of Southern Right. And so, you know, Southern on a label is denoting white rural traditions. And that's a sound that is is going to be about framing whiteness, sonic whiteness in America, different from Caruso and the opera that um, is dominating the recording um, industry at this time. And then we get crazy blues and all of these jazz recordings and all these subsequent recordings creating this context of black sound in America. And so, you know, this, this strategy of race records was very lucrative, you know, um, rather than just simply releasing material, you had recording companies like, okay, who put out advertisements such as this. And if you look, this is an actual advertisement. The jazz hounds were actually initially just a collective of instrumentalists who worked um, on these series of recordings, but they uh, get rebranded as Mamie Smith's band um, and their personnel is constantly changing. Um, and so again, this is, is, is the, the record company um, capitalizing on what is a growing appetite for Black music in America in the 20s and how that is also going to be important in terms of framing white modernity, not just Black modernity in this time. I don't have time to talk about that today, um, but that that is something to take in consideration. And one of the reasons why we have F. Scott Fitzgerald um, through his work, his literary work, and his lived experience embodying this kind of um, engagement with Black culture and, and the sounds of, of Black America at this time. I would be remiss if I didn't say that this marketing strategy did not impact how the Black community uh, also viewed the viability of this music and culture. Uh, out of this, um, this well storm of race music and race records, we, we see the emergence of the first black owned recording company, Black Swan Records, which was in existence from 1921 to 1923. 
And what Black Swan uh, uh, um, really was trying to do was to not just record blues, but to elevate Black culture as part of this larger ideological focus of the Negro Renaissance. And so uh, they recorded Black uh uh, concert artists, opera singers, uh, black um, ensembles, not just jazz, but also classical ensemble string quartets and whatever, it was short lived largely because it did not have the same financial and economic base as a Paramount or an OK or, um, you know, or RCA Victor or any of these other uh, major companies that really began to uh, to grow in their um, grow economically, but grow in their influence over the race market um, idiom. Let me just say this is big bucks for uh, the recording industry. In fact, it's the blues craze of the 1920s that. Um, really progresses the recording industry. It is a uh, it is estimated that these labels between 1920 up until 1933 and 34 when we start to see a decline in recording co uh, culture uh, sold an estimate 5 million records a year. And so, you know, we here we are talking about a million dollar, if not a billion dollar industry that is being scripted out of the success of this first record. So the question is, what is the legacy of Crazy Blues and how did Crazy Blues change the world? Well, Crazy Blues in many ways opened a soundscape of, of different variant forms of black music engaging with the new technology of the studio and the record. You know, in time, record companies move beyond just simply these vaudeville blues inspired songs that we've heard and, and began to reclaim the country blues traditions of not just Ma Rainey, but other male performers like um, Charlie, uh, Papa Charlie Jackson, um, Robert Johnson, um, Willie Brown, Sunhouse, the list goes on and on. It would also expand to include jazz recordings and preaching and gospel. And so the the legacy of of crazy blues it from a sonic point of view is far stretching. From a cultural point of view, it is also important because these recordings are also going to to influence a generation of artists who are going to define different aesthetical approaches in genres. Sophie Tucker, a white singer, drawing on these early blues women to create her own idiom, but also gospel performers like Mahalia Jackson, uh, drawing very um, strongly on what she hears in the records of Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith. Billie Holiday listening to these records. Louis Armstrong, the man who, you know, pushes jazz into a more modern aesthetic, not only listening to these records, but also playing on these records. So one song writers push to have black vocalists featured as part of this growing soundscape of recorded music in America would ignite a cultural revolution whose uh, byproducts, whose legacy still ripples in what we hear today. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. That was awesome. I could really listen to you talk all day long. Um, we actually have some really good questions. Um, let's see. I'm going to start with, um, let's see. So this one was one I was wondering myself. Uh, was Mamie Smith related to or was there any relationship with Bessie Smith? I mean, I know it's a common last name, but mm -hmm. was there any relation? Very good question. No, they were they were not related at all. 
But what happens is as a result of Mamie Smith's popularity, because she goes on to record a great deal, uh, just in the year 1920 to 1921, she's recording almost 40 sides. That's 40 records. That's a lot. It's especially a lot considering that we're dealing with acoustic recording. So this is not electric recording. We don't have the ability in this early uh, practice to be able to edit, uh, to be able to overdub. So it's a very archaic and it's very arduous in terms of the production of these records, right? Um, and, and so her popularity and the growing popularity of Bessie Smith, who actually ironically gets a recording contract before Ma Rainey, the woman who mentors her, right, uh, subscribes a certain value to the last name Smith. So what promoters started doing was that, you know, anybody with the last name Smith, if you go into a tent show or theater show, you know, it might be Trixie Smith, but Trixie would be this big and Smith would be extra large because, you know, they were trying to pull you in to make you think you were either going to hear Mamie or Bessie or one of her, their sisters. So that that they had no biological relationship, but that shared name um, really helped propel uh, um, the popularity of the blues. I see. That was a lucky break for, for <laughs> Bessie, for sure. <laughs> um, so I also, too, was curious um, about the same question. And I'm so glad it got asked. Um, what kind of reception did Mamie get in Cincinnati after the success of Crazy Blues? And does Cincinnati do anything to celebrate her now? You know what? That is the part of the conversation I really want to know. I'm not sure she ever made it back here. And I'm not sure how much of her family was actually still here. It wasn't until recently that that her um, actual birth date was uh, cor corroborated. Because, you know, in early literature, she is um, rumored to be... Uh, to be born much earlier than 1891. And a scholar a few years ago found, actually found her birth certificate that said 1891. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Arts Work, um, the uh, nonprofit arts agency here in um, Cincinnati started a mural project, right? Highlighting famous people from Cincinnati. And, you know, there's a James Brown mural, but there's a Mamie Smith mural down there now um, that actually has uh, her superimposed on the sheet music for Crazy Blues. So there's been this reclamation of Mamie Smith's legacy, but, you know, um, it's still, you know, people are still teasing out what is the real connection with Cincinnati. I see. Well, bless her heart. No, no woman really wants to share what her birth year is. She's kept a good secret. Uh, let's see. Um, Mark actually mentioned in the comments, he says he just discovered that Mamie Smith's movies are available in the public domain and can be viewed on YouTube. Um, he says he has plans to watch Murder on Lenox Avenue um, this evening. Um, I had no idea that she was also an actress. Do you know much, much about her as an actress? Yeah, I know she made that transit. I did not know. Thank you for that. I did not know they were in the public domain now, you know, um, because what her career, uh, at least, you know, in the early parts of the 20s, really, um, really correlated with the emergence of this you know, black centered industry in terms of popular culture. So the film, uh, the stage show, the nightclub, the recordings, they were all about of that. Um, and she was able to really make that transition in a way that Ma Rainey was not, you know, Ma Rainey was much older, um, really didn't like the North. Um, Bessie Smith wasn't, um, you know, Bessie Smith does make uh, the transition to one movie. She's in one film. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but, you know, in many ways, uh, Mamie Smith embodied, you know, the Renaissance woman. She embodied the modernity uh, of, of black womanhood that was being projected by the Renaissance. So she gets, uh, she, she transitions into some of these other areas. 
Awesome. I actually uh, read a little plot synopsis of Murder on Linux. It seems like something I might want to tune into as well. Um, let's see. Steve asks, did Crazy Blues or other records by Ma Rainey or, or Bessie Smith and or other Black artists, did they get much play on radio stations at all during their, their peak time? Not, no. Uh, and that's a very good question. Um, you know, because radio is coming into its infancy in the 20s. Um, and and radio at that point was doing more live performances than it was actual recordings. So the recordings were used for two purposes during this period in time for artists. So, you know, recordings, uh, you know, were extension of these live performances because the live performances were more lucrative. So many artists really didn't even see the value of recording. You know, Ma Rainey was one of those people. Uh, and it also to allow people to take that experience of the theater and the tent show home, right? But the recording technology was very limited, which you've got a three minute or less record, right? Um, and so, um, you know, it, it wasn't feasible for many artists. They didn't they didn't like the the limitations that it placed upon them, but but also you you know you don't have radio stations who are engaging with recording culture in the same way that we see in the you know later in the 20th century, so you know artists were more apt to perform live in the radio studio. Now what ultimately happens that I didn't get to talk about is that the recording boom that Crazy Blues you know ignites. Uh, you know, begins to dissipate with the Great Depression because people can't afford to buy Victrolas. People can't afford to buy records. Records cost anywhere from 75 cents to $1.25, depending on what time when you're buying a record, right? That's a lot of money. That's a, and it's a lot of money in the South if you're making 25 cents per 100 pounds of cotton that you're picking, right? You know, you're you, that's that's a week's wages in some cases, right? Depending on who you are and, and your productivity. Um, but radio starts to supplant these records. So people start to buy radios versus these Victrolas. So, you know, radio, so these performances, um, you know, many people begin to collect them, but 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 really radio becomes the focal point. Now they'll be played for a while, but the, the culture is changing. So that these records become passe as we move into the 1930s and they're giving way to a new jazz aesthetic of singing. Right. And so, you know, this is why people often talk about Billie Holiday um, as being an extension of this tradition, because, you know, she utilized she took on the blues ethos. She wrote some modern blues songs, but she really modernized these songs in a way, you know, the blues aesthetic in a way that made it palatable to the changing audience of that time. I think I answered your question. Um, Tammy, you answered in the most perfect way because you actually answered Lydia's question um, and sort of, she's asked with the great migration and better economic situation for black Americans, how common um, was the phonograph player in households and communities? You, I know you touched on that and the, the expense. Um, and I'm sure that as there was some improvement, there was some increase in the availability of that. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you certainly answered that question as well. Um, and also when you touched on Billie Holiday, um, we had a question from June um, are there modern performers that you would most compare to Mamie Smith or who have been maybe most influenced by um, the movement that Crazy Blues started? Yeah, I think, you know, you, you, you've got Billie Holiday, but you also have Ethel Waters, who is a contemporary of, of Mamie Smith and goes much further. Uh, and, and I would recommend looking at Ethel Waters before the 1970s, you know, because she kind of had a, a spiritual awakening and conversion experience. So the latter part of her life and her career is spent as a singer with Billy Graham's ministries, right? Most people know her for singing His Eyes on the Sparrow. 
uh, but she represented how blues singers who could make that transition uh, in sound and uh, in physical presence, right, and in repertory, you know, could find a pathway into Broadway. And then she even went on to Hollywood. Then there's Alberta Hunter, you know, uh, who was in Chicago during this time, but actually has a resurgence uh, in her career um, in the 1970s. You know, so she's part of the rediscovery of this. Um, so, you know, uh, Mamie Smith, unfortunately, dies penniless, uh, which is what happens to many of these women. You know, so many Black women recorded you know, und or performed in these tent shows and theater circuits um, during this period in time. So it was a great pathway for Black women to really escape, you know, sharecropping, agricultural work, domestic work, prostitution, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, in some way, I didn't get to talk about it, but in some ways, you know, what we have here in their music is a fuller glimpse of Black life because Bl women's blues music talks about things that men's blues doesn't even talk about. I mean, love is talked about on a different spectrum, you know, and not just heterosexual love. We have people who are talking about queer identities and, and, and non-marital status relationships, you know, and, and you have them really providing us a insight about that migration experience and what migration meant for black women because people thought the north was the promised land and in some cases depending on where you were it was no different than what the south you know you you just you know you you still battled the clan and lynchings and all of this so there are many women that stretch into the 50s and, and stretch into the 60s 70s and 80s and there are women who reclaim this you know janice joplin reclaim some of this this uh, repertory uh, in during her career, right? Um, so there there is a vast genealogy of women who extend from Mamie Smith. Mamie Smith in the recorded aspect and Ma Rainey in the live aspects of it. Oh, Tammy, as always, you put on just a remarkably fantastic presentation. Um, I know I speak for many others when I say really, truly, we, we could watch you every day. This would be a delightful part of each lunchtime hour. So we so appreciate you being here. That is all the time we have for today. As a reminder, a recording of this fantastic presentation will be available on our website later today. Thank you again and again to Dr. Tammy Kernodal for leading us in this webinar today. To learn more about the important work of the Humanity Center at Miami and other lectures in this series, please go to the Humanity Center, oh, humanitycenter.miamioh.edu. I want to direct you to the right place. And to donate or become a friend of the humanities, please go to give to miamioh.org slash humanity center. And please check out our other new and archived webinar presentations at alumlc.org slash miamioh. Thank you again for joining us today. Love and honor to you all.